All right, you ready? Ready as I'll ever be. <laughs> what do you want to talk about? We're going to talk about mostly about the speedball. Now looking all right there, Jesse. <laughs> all right, we're going on the record. You ready? Ready. I guess. Like your ears. <laughs> Me and names, uh, I'm lucky to remember yours, Sam. <laughs> we can shoot the shit all day anyway, you know me. looks now exactly like it did back then, except for a few coats of paint. And they dug out a bowl. In, in essence, that's what it was, speed bowl. The original owners were um, Larry Peters and Bill Hoffman, my uncle Fred and my father Frank, and Tony Albino. Those are the original owners of the track. They picked out this particular piece of land because it was really very, a very good piece. It was like 33 or 35 acres of just flat land. It was all, you know, a farm originally. Larry Peters and Bill Hoffman, they were very interested in racing. So uh, they got together themselves and they formed a corporation. They thought this would be an ideal setup, you know. It, in this area, there was very little in that respect. I just graduated from college, I was 22. My father and uncle were in a partnership in a construction business. Benvenuti and Sons built that racetrack and my brother was the superintendent on the job. My father worked for them, Fred and Frank Benvenuti. And uh, so as they were building the bowl, we used to go over there and pull in and check things out, that kind of stuff, you know. It was kind of neat. It took approximately nine months to build the whole thing and it opened in 1951. I remember that the first practice session they had traffic backed up all the way to the Waterford Airport because they used to be the main road to the Speed Bowl before they built I-95. They didn't even have enough parking to accommodate the crowd that they had there you know they were parked up on 85 and every other place. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to racing here at the New London Waterford Speed Bowl. In just a few minutes, we'll be underway with this afternoon's racing program, and you'll have plenty of thrills and chills as you watch them bumper to bumper and wheel to wheel as they roar around this third of a mile track here at the New London Waterford Speed Bowl. 
track was built in 1951, and originally it was uh, dirt. Most of the racing was all dirt track in those days anyway. First three weeks, they ran dirt. It was a blue diamond mix from New Haven. It was a New Haven trap rocks mix, and it was like uh, stone dust. And it was packed and watered and packed and watered, and it was treated like if you wanted to make a clay track. When it did start, they had, the whole thing was built out of cinders. And they had a first couple of races, they had to shut down. They were taking everybody to the doctor and the hospital. All the cinders were getting up. They were slinging up into the grandstand. After the first couple of heats, it just didn't stay together. And, it, and everyone in the first five rows of the grandstand came out, they looked like Coleman. I mean, the place, where it, was a, it was a dust bowl. After the first race was run, uh, they had to make major changes because the, uh, the spectators were awful dirty. The, the, the crushed stone did not work. Everybody come on the track covered in black soot and everything else. And of course, that's what we had to learn was uh, to come from dirt on asphalt. So uh, the, the guys that owned the track at that particular time, my father being one of them, the next week they made arrangements and had the track asphalt paved. So they made it into a, a third mile paved with a dirt strip on the outside edges of the track. They still left that with cinders and stuff. And you know, it was pretty neat because when the guys got off in the racetrack, they'd get into the cinders and they, they wouldn't hit the wall so hard. It was supposed to slow the cars down in the event they got up too high or they are going in too fast. They thought that would, you know, help them out from really getting damaged badly. A modified race car, that, I think that's where it's got its name from. You took a car and, and you kind of modified the car to what you wanted it to be. Put the kind of junkyard and took it home and took the body off the chassis and cut it all up as much as we could. Back then, everybody built their own stuff. You know, nobody bought, bought anything. They built it. You know, nobody, uh, you know, they didn't go buy motors and stuff. Everything was built. As far as modifying the cars, a lot of people just ran a stock engine. They just, you know, they just lightened up the car and ran stock engines. And then some people that were cool would modify. We didn't know anything about modifying a car. We kids would just, I mean, like, you know, we, we're going to race it, have a race car. We cut the fenders and roll. How's the car look? That's cool. <laughs> if you had a good head on your shoulders and you could think of something that somebody else didn't and you could use this or use that which kept the car still legal then you could make the car run if i can outdo you that was the name of the game i outdid him and i outdo you come up with these different ideas bill congdon he had a bus line for the school kids and one night when he blew his motor for the following week, he took one of the motors out of the school buses and put it in the race car so that uh, he was using a, you know, a, a school bus motor in the race car. They would uh, lose a battery. They'd go out in the parking lot and grab a battery. They had a problem with the radiator. Some of the cars out there had the right radiator for them. And it, it was amazing what they made work and go fast. That we would go to the track and drive the car two pitmen in the back sitting on the tires and the gas cap and all our equipment in the trunk of the car. And if you bent the car, you spent the night at the track getting the car back together so you could get home. Wow. Yeah, that's, that was racing. The first real hero at, at the bowl was Mo Gersey. Mo Gersey, yeah, he was a character. Mo Gersey, who was my favorite driver, was one of the first drivers to uh, have a racing attire. He would have his own little striped pants and a pink shirt he'd wear. He really was the first image. You know, the first shows up in big cars and, you know, drives in Bermuda shorts and had all these fancy clothes and was the first guy that I think understood the importance of, of personalities in the sport. Oh, money bags. Money bags, Mo. Best money driver that ever lived. 
I mean, uh, I remember one night he walked off with like $1,500 back then in the 50s, which was unheard of. Whenever there was money, he'd win. If he paid 500 to win, and that was a lot of money back then, but it would pay 700 to win over here, you wouldn't get him at the 500 to win. No way. You'd get him over here. That's where you'd see him. Of course he was. He was a tough competitor too, but in some of the cars he used to have, yeah, he come to Spivo when I was there, and he, had, he built this 14 car, he could take his hands out and go like that, out both winners and put them out there. That car was so narrow. Mo Gersey drove for the Garuti brothers, the Garuti brothers 14, and he was kind of like the class of the field. And that spelled G-H-E-R-Z-I. I've heard a lot of people say Guernsey, <laughs> and it's not Guernsey. I used to call it Guernsey, and I remember his wife saying, he's not a cow. I said, well, I dispute that. <laughs> he got the name Moneybags because of running wherever the money was, and he won a lot. He did a lot of winning. When you talked about the bowl, the first name that would come up, I you see what Guernsey did, you know, Guernsey showed up with Bermuda shorts on, and, and <laughs> you know. Uh, what was it, 1951, was it? Well, we was running Seekonk, and this, this Combardo was running Seekonk. And he went down there, and he said, come on down. He said, you'll do good down here. When I got there, they just asphalted the track. They had the dirt on the outside. But they used to use have two nights. They had Wednesday night racing and Saturday night racing. Wednesday night was a small payoff. And Wednesday night, the show was much better than Saturday night because you didn't want to lose out if you were running second because you, you were going to make a, you know, a lot more money on a Saturday. On Wednesday, it was all like nickels and dimes, and so you just raced, and I think the show was a better show on a Wednesday. We used to go down there Wednesdays and Saturday nights, and I won, I won a lot of, most of my races were won on Wednesday nights. And you get a trophy every Wednesday, and you they kept giving you trophies. Then they gave you a watch, and then they gave you a pot. And it was like, I mean, they just got tired of handing you out trophies. We raced Wednesday at Seekonk, uh, Wednesday at Speed Bowl, Friday at Seekonk, Saturday at the Speed Bowl, and Sunday Thompson. With the same car? Yeah, same car. Wow. <laughs> Tell us how you found out that you were, became the track champion. I uh, probably didn't know till next week. <laughs> So when you uh, left there, you had no idea whether you or Mo was, was the champion? No, we, we didn't, we didn't uh, think about all that stuff. It was more about winning races Just back then? winning races and doing what we had to do. We always had the midgets running. That was a very popular, too. They had a lot of the great race drivers here in the country race these midgets. If you got AAA midgets, then they, you were part of the national scene. They brought in AAA, which was the, the, the sanctioning body for Indianapolis. And they had Indianapolis drivers drive here, like Johnny Thompson. The first midget race at Waterford was won by Johnny Thompson, who some people say is the best open cockpit, still the best open cockpit driver New England ever produced. You would see these guys at Waterford and then later find out they were racing at Flat Rock and racing at 16th Street, you know, and racing at Denver and all these famous midget tracks. That was what happened with AAA. And ARDC back then really had a very, very close relationship with, with AAA. But right from the beginning, Waterford was a NEMA track. NEMA was formed in 1953. The second race on NEMA all time was run at run at Waterford. They ran Memorial Day of 1953 at Seekonk, and the next day they run at Waterford. Waterford's association with NEMA goes back to NEMA's first year. Half of my career was in stock cars, and the other half was in midgets. Dave Humphrey was a nice guy, is a nice guy. He uh, did incredible in midgets. He really, really, he uh, took the world by storm driving a midget. He did very well. They put on quite a show, of course. Back then, they didn't have roll cages. The midgets didn't even have roll bars. I mean, they had a, 
it was the car was built, you know, with a little hump here, and that was the roll bar. There was no cage, nothing like that. Did you ever want to drive a midget? No. How come? Had no desire. <laughs> I want a little more than that above me. <laughs> you know, midgets had a big lever on the outside, so if you wanted to brake the car, you had a throttle in the middle of the cockpit, and your brake was out here. And then you had a chain that you picked up, and you held it, and you told the push car to push you. And then when you got going at a good speed, you dropped the chain, and it would engage. It was direct drive from the engine to the rear. Direct drive, no transmission. Talk about safety, that was really spooky. But uh, that's a whole different deal with the open drive shafts between your legs and stuff, you know. <laughs> and boy, when you, you push that pedal down, they were so touchy that the, uh, the minute you hit that throttle, the thing would want to go on you, want to turn on you. And when you went around the corner, you went like this. You kept trying to break the, the spin all the way through. And then if you were lined up and you punched it, man, that thing go down there and take your breath away. And the thing really took off. It was I mean, it was like a rocket ship compared to the the stock car because the stock car was fast, but the thing was, the exhilaration in the midget was like instant, and uh, it was quite an experience. The thing about midgets, they'll tell you, is that how fast you get the car straight out of a turn, and Waterford has that straightaway. Oh, it's ideal size for the midgets. Waterford, they actually straighten those cars out, and I think that's what makes it the premier midget track in New England. They tell me I was there opening day in 1951 because Joe Coulard, our next door neighbor, lived across the street was racing and my parents went to the speed bowl to see him race when they were. And now, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we have the old eight ball special driven by New London's own Go Joe Coulard. Joe, it's good to talk to you this afternoon. I'd like to ask you, what kind of a car is this? This is a Frazier, 1947 six-cylinder job. 1947 Frazier. Uh, what do you right. think you got to do out there this afternoon to win this feature? Well, it all depends. I heard one time there was 21 seconds, so that indicates around 68 mile an hour. About 68 miles an hour. Good enough, Joe. Well, I want to wish you a lot of good luck out there and go, Joe. I hope so. Thank you. My father built this house in, in 53. We moved out here and I used to go over there and Shaney used to run the uh, concession there. And the, he was a photographer. And he used to sell the Illustrated Speedway News and I used to go over there and sell the papers and get a penny a paper. And that's how I used to get in so I could go to the races and see the races. And I did that for quite a few years. He was a real nice guy, that Shaney. Red Foot, he drew that J2. He always put on a good show there. He was a good, good competitor. He was good, you know. Very smooth, J2. Charge into that fourth turn. The 76 being driven by Bill Slater and the J2 by Red Foot. Got him that straight away and into that first turn as they battle it out. He was a nice guy. He was a clean driver. He uh, ran real well for a while. and uh, But he was always there and he was a very conservative guy. He was a nice person. Yeah. He was fun to race with. And now around the win. Those guys used to travel up and down the East Coast, and they, they would race anywhere, any night, with any car. Him and uh, Dennis uh, Zimmerman, Rene Chaland, Flemke was one. They all traveled down to Virginia, and they'd clean house down there every week. They were feared when they showed up. They figured that uh, there was a lot of interest and they started the second division. Claiming car was uh, anybody would build a race car uh, very cheap and if it, if it won, somebody could claim the car for $250. And if you didn't uh, allow them to do it, they wouldn't be allowed to race anymore. In other words, if you wanted to claim this car, you could pay $250 to the owner and, and buy the car. They were the modifieds, sometimes called sportsmen, but they were really modifieds. And then they were the non-Fords, the six-cylinder cars. 
So look them over now as they bank off that fourth turn and around to the green checkered flag from your starter, Dick Jensen, as we get underway with the first 10-lap qualifying event for the non-Fords here at the London Waterford Speed Bowl this afternoon. They rev them up now as they go to that green. Your starter is packing them in. Will they go? Watch them as they go. And they're off. The 31 immediately down low into the lead into that first turn. Watch them. 31 into the lead now, moving on into that second turn, you're 31. We needed a, a, another division along with the modified division because you don't have enough cars half the time. They run a non-Ford class and then run a modified class uh, and the drivers could run both divisions. First time I went to the track, I used to live in the Woodland Trailer Park. Bud Maddell lived there and he used to run a 99 Junior, like 51, 52, 53 right in there. He used to bring the race car there once in a while, and I'd go down there, a couple of us kids, and he let us get in it and polish it and do all that. And his wife used to go out there, and I, that's how I got going to the speedball. I went with his wife a couple of times, and I got kind of got hooked into it. Now well, look them over as they roll off of that fourth turn around to the green. And your starter, Dick Jensen, will they go? Watch them as they go, and there they go. Wheel to wheel, bumper to bumper, watch them into that first turn, and they roll in there, battling for those positions. Around now, into the second turn as they go. I don't know if everybody knew it, but he was still in the service when he was racing. And he used to get in a lot of trouble because when you're in the service, you're not supposed to race. But he, he got away with it a long time. And he threw a wheel. This car, the one away, threw a wheel there. And look at him pull himself off. And here comes the car. Here comes the tire rolling onto the track now. Well, the week before, we dropped the right front wheel and went up into the stands and hit this little boy that was in the stands and uh, didn't hurt him badly, but it hurt him. And anyway, uh, the following week, I won the main event. And that little boy came out and presented me with the trophy. And uh, they gave me a bag of, I think it was $500 in a bag of silver dollars. And I told the little boy, well, you can have as much as you can dig out of the bag with one hand. And the kid reached in there and took a handful. <laughs> yeah, that was really cool. I used to get a big kick out of war having the cars warm up and seeing the crowd gather, you know. See, you go in there, all of a sudden it's just the people that are working there, okay? And all the cars are usually in by that time and all the guys are working in the pits. You hear them firing up the cars in the pits and everything. Then you go out and you warm the cars up. They take a few hot laps and then they go in and make some more adjustments and that sort of thing. And then the crowd filters in, you know, and and it really it's it's neat. It's it's just something that's hard to describe. That the feeling that you get, you know, when you hear them winding up, you know, and they're they're coming and they're going down the chute, and you you love a good sounding engine. You hear those engines and it gets you all pumped up, you know. Jesus, you wish you were in there, you know. They had uh, starting spaces, starting boxes on the front chute for first, second, third, fourth, fifth, and the cars would come out and park on the front chute in, in order, two by two, in their spots, and they'd get announced. Flagman was really involved. He was always down on the front chute doing stuff. I remember thinking that he kind of ran the event because he had that look about him, you know, for many, many years. You know, back then, flagging was a lot different than it was today. We had no radios, no communication. When you took that flagger job, you ran them races without you to hear them from nobody. And now at our microphone this afternoon is Mr. Dick Jensen. Dick, it's nice to have you here. Dick is the official starter here at the... Well, it's nice to see you. Dick's the official starter here at the New London Waterford Speedball. What do you think about this afternoon's crowd? Well, they will probably fill the place by the time... Well, of course, we've got about 15, 15 minutes before day. race time, but uh, we should get underway. Well, thanks a lot, Dick, for stopping by. And good Hope luck out there. The show today. Right, thank you. starter uh, used to start from the infield. Well, the flagman stood on the track. It was on the track. He wasn't in the box. 
and he would start the race standing on the track. And when the cars got to him, he would just walk back, run backwards, waving the flags and jumping in the air. And the cars would all go by him, and then he would run up on the uh, on the flag stand, turn around and wave the flag and run, run for the inside. Did you ever get nervous to hitting them? Uh, you come close a lot of time. It was a good for showing his ship, but it wasn't the safest place to be out there. You know? A lot of times he had to run for the infield because he uh, flags, gave someone the black flag the week before. It was exciting because the cars are going whizzing by him on the start and he would jump up in the air in the la and in the last track car he would kind of like dive over the last car as it went by him. So that was uh, something I always remember. He was a very colorful individual and uh, that was always an exciting part. What it did, nobody ever jumped to start because you didn't pass till past the start finish line because there was a guy standing in the middle of the racetrack. You know? <laughs> and there was no stand, it was just a pair of stairs with a railing and that's where he stood. No caution flags, all you had was red flags. Every time it was a wreck, you would, they would stop the race. And everybody would pull up on the front stretch. So look them over now as they line up for the restart of this race after that accident on the third turn. A guy would run down from the scorer's booth with the, with the paper and he would come out with your lineup where you're going to start behind. You're starting behind da 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 and then you'd all get lined up, go around once and they wave the flag and you'd start racing again, yeah. The Cohansey Fire Department always send out a real good contingent of volunteers over there and, and, they, and they really got real sharp at what they were doing. They were really very, very good. There was a Jeep and a, uh, a Ghostbusters style ambulance <laughs> on the infield. <laughs> we had our own ambulance at that time because Waterford didn't have that many ambulances and we bought used ambulances and we had our own push vehicles when we had the midgets come in and then we always had independent uh, wrecker outfits come in and, and take care of uh, that phase of the thing. And it's been out the number four, oh, and we got it right in front of the grandstand. The number four spins out off that dangerous fourth turn and is levered by another car. So your number four car spins out on that dangerous and treacherous fourth turn here at the London Waterford Speed Bowl and is clobbered by the number 17. But both drivers are out of there, they're all right. The crew here at the London Waterford Speed Bowl has cleaned up the track after that accident. The Cerisi wrecker pulls away and will be underway in just a few moments. I was about 15 and uh, we used to have to work some Saturday, so I, I never wanted to miss a race. So we always work, and then we try and make the features, you know. It was about 6.30 or so in, at night, and I uh, got a phone call. You have a wrecker? I said, yeah. He said, well, this is a speedboat. Can you bring the wrecker to the speedboat? We need a wrecker tonight. I guess Patton and Webster, I think, was doing it, or Cerisi, I don't remember back then, who, but they couldn't make it that night. They had, I said, we sure can. <laughs> and uh, we go booming over there <laughs> and uh, we come through the pit gate about 40 miles an hour in the first races on the track right so they started the race and we went out in the infield and we worked the night and it was fun we had you know a couple of kids we had a good time we worked from then on for i don't know maybe two or three years in the in the pits on the record That. Look at him come out of there. He's all right. There's thrills and chills galore. Well, the wreckers now move in. The driver is out of there. He's all right. You can see him to the left of the wrecker there. Thrills and chills galore here at the New London Waterford Speed Bowl as they roll them, rock them, and wreck them. And look at that car right up against the barrier. They're trying to get it down. The pit crews are working. And now walking towards us is the driver of that car rolled into the barrier in front of the grandstand. What's your name, sir? Vince Cerrito. Vince Cerrito? Well, Vince, that was quite a roll you had there. Oh. Can you tell it's us that? Third one I had this year. Third one this Third year. One. And you walk away from all. All of them. Good so enough, far. Vince. Keep them thrilled. It was insane. It was just wild, crazy, and no one cared. Everyone went as fast as they could, as hot as they could, and if they rolled over, they get out jumping up and down. That was cool. <laughs> over on the fourth turn, if you'll 
Notice there's a car that's up and over, right up and over into the barrier on that fourth turn. He's all right, though. He's crawling out. He's out of there. He's okay. So with that jam up off that second turn over there, the fellow that was driving that car received a real thang on his noggin. And these drivers, of course, are afforded the very best in medical attention here at the track. And he's now in the ambulance, and they're checking him over. And uh, I'm sure he's going to be all right as the ambulance pulls away. And we always had a track doctor, you know, which we, who we paid for. Usually it was a resident from L&M. And then there were a couple of them that really liked racing, and they would come up for the most part. Well, uh, doctor, I'd like to have you, if you would, please explain to the people why you are here. And uh, just, it's pretty obvious, but I mean, so they understand. It is a rule that you're in attendance at all times, is it not? Yes, doctor must be in attendance at all times, even at the practice runs before the race. Otherwise, there's no drivers allowed on the track until you yourself are here, is that right, sir? No drivers allowed on until the doctor and is present. I see. And every precaution is taken for the safety of these drivers, is that yes, they all must wear safety helmets, safety belt, goggles, and their cars must be equipped for safety devices such as firewalls, rollover bars, protected gas tanks, and the like. I see, sir, and thank you very much. We had a safety belt. It was hooked up with a chain and went underneath the chassis of the car, and that was your belt. It was one chain held end to end, and it sat across your lap, because it didn't go across your hips, because it was underneath the car, and that was our safety belt. Seat belts were just uh, around the lap, uh, no harnesses or anything like that. Safety belt, fire extinguisher, and that was about it. And it was only a lap belt, there was no shoulder harnesses, that was about it. The rollover bars were nothing but a piece of metal or whatever you could come up with. These cars were tall, they were wide. Uh, I'm not even sure they had roll cages, although they say they did. They checked cars, but rules were made to be broken. <laughs> uh, some of them were reported as being just plastic pipes welded, not welded, but glued into the cars. We had roll bars inside, but that's about it. At first we ran front seats that were in the car, the, the front seat that went across. The seat was an old airplane seat. We used to buy them at the, uh, I don't know, they had a place they used to sell all that stuff, old war stuff. You know, put new shocks on it, well, then we used the shocks that we had, just would open up the shock and put a little more heavier oil in. The real narrow tires, I mean street tires. We ran street tires. And that chain and the safety belt were all set to go. Most of the guys drove in t-shirts with the, some of the helmets weren't even, not very safe. All we had was a little t-shirt, you know, and a, an old Cromwell helmet. Just a t-shirt and a pair of pants and that's it, off you went. Around that fourth turn, wheel to wheel, bumper to bumper, look at them as they go across that starting line, around to the checkered flag. Now battling it out for 323 in the 600 into that first turn as they battle for first place position here for the London Waterford Speed Bowl. Now into the second turn. Then over and back on its wheels and what a jam up that is. That's a real king sized one. Five or six cars piled up and little Tommy Van Epps in the 50-50 went right up and over and back on its wheels. Now your ambulance with the doctor going over to check the driver. I'm sure he's all right. He hopped right out after it was over. And of course the wreckers standing by as the pit crews come up to check their cars. How do you feel now that uh, it's all over? Good. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Tommy Van Epps who uh, did the flip in our film as you saw him go over. And Tom, if you'll step back just a little bit, I'd like to explain it about the car, but you can see, it's, is it back running now? Yeah. Huh? Yeah, it's all ready. Well, all ready to go, and you're all set, to, right? Yeah. Well, that's the way, and good luck to you, Tom. Actually, we had very little, you know, very few problems. We had some, only one fatality, and that was Jack Griffin. Yeah, Jack Griffin went to every race there was. It wasn't a front runner, but he loved to race. We'd go up to Canada, he'd be in Canada. No matter where we raced, Jack Griffin was there. He was a big guy, and in those days, in the modified, they were channeled and chopped. I don't know if you understand what channeling means when they, when they actually squeeze them 
close like this together and the steering wheel's in the middle of the cockpit as opposed to one side. And then they're chopped, the roof is cut down. Cut the roof down and uh, cut the body in half and made it a little smaller and uh, pushed the engine back a little and uh, made the car a lot lighter. And the power weight to ratio was incredible. You know, for, we were a lot lighter than most of the cars that were running at that time. P.D. Jackson. Was his uh, racing name, Jack Griffin was his real name. He was a sailor at the sub base. And because, you know, he was, he was supposed to be racing. And the, he raced in a cut down, which was very dangerous. You know, they would like uh, chop up the cars. The driver would sit in the middle of the, of the car and ha could have both hands out each door. That's how narrow the car was. And he was such a big man that his head was above the roll bars. And he bought a, a car that uh, Red Bullock and myself built many years ago. He was about six foot two. The car was built for a guy that was about 5'7". You know, I was there that night when that happened. Really? He had a little, little cut down. Uh, the night that he uh, passed, uh, I was going by him while he was in the infield, rolling over. And the night that he was killed, it was in, uh, in the summertime, he flipped down the whole front straightaway. His car number was 242. He hit the bulkhead and flipped and we couldn't get him out in time. I mean, it was, it was, it was a sin. I mean, that killed us. We didn't want that to happen. When they went and looked at that race car, the whole top of the tubing was built out of like real thin stuff, like uh, exhaust tubing. See, back then you had no way of checking that stuff and they never thought they'd get in a wreck like that. And then he went upside down and that, that tubing just collapsed and he was just bouncing on his head. They knew something was wrong because I remember um, the ambulance taking him out and his wife was running down the down in the stands wanting to get to the ambulance but they wouldn't let her because everybody knew that he was dead and when we get to the hospital they had pronounced him dead it was the only fatality they have ever had dead a lot of them got hurt but uh you know it was just the one fatality and that was because they ran cut downs and the following year cut downs were banned and you had three bad accidents that year. You had Hank Stevens get almost burned alive in the back uh, in the last race of the year. A guy named Clark was hurt badly, uh, and he flipped his car. They were banned shortly after that because everyone realized really how bad it was to try to get them out of the car in the event something were to happen. You know. You know the aggravation of the hot break, and the, I don't know how other guys feel about. It their racing career, what they do while they're racing. I know myself, they come in second. I'd rather be in the pit. I had a win. There was only one spot and that was first. There was not a second, not a third, not a fourth. I'm a, with that I was, and if the guy would beat me, I didn't particularly like that guy if he beat me two or three times at all. So when I was started to run real well, because a lot of people didn't like me too much and I can understand it, that's fine, right. you know? When you come from like, New England, well, Rhode Island, and you, you go out to, you get there sort of like last minute, set up your car, and as far as you're not there that long, you know, you, you do the time trials, and then you race, and then you go home. Uh, where a lot of guys are there for a couple of hours and chatting with all these people, so I really didn't get to socialize a lot, because I'd be coming from another track, or I'd been working all night on the car, and we have that long haul from, from Pawtucket to, all the way to uh, Connecticut, to Waterford. 1951, United ran the races then, which was under the heading of uh, Rex Records and Lou Giuliani and uh, Harvey Tattersall. Harvey's United circuit in the 50s was the biggest thing in the Northeast. I mean, they had so many tracks they ran with, not just with jalopies or modifieds, but with the Grand American late models. At the New London Waterford Speed Bowl, for this, the 100 lap. Feature event of the afternoon racing program for the season. This is the final event. This is a new car race. Your pace car, the number eight, being driven by Mike Ward. And on his outside, in the number 43, it's Whitey Brainerd as we pace these cars around the track. He ran convertible races for a while. If he ran a convertible race somewhere, he'd have all the modified guys in convertibles. Down in front of you, 
uh, in front of the camera at this particular time is the president of the United Stock Car Racing Club, and he's giving the drivers the instructions which will be used in this 100-mile feature race for this afternoon's program. There are strict laws that govern these races, and Mr. Records is explaining them to the drivers. United ran the races until 1954 when there was a break. They didn't get along with each other. It was uh, they just didn't mesh. After a while, uh, that marriage didn't work too well. The United wasn't popular with the drivers because Harvey Tattersall was a hard man to get along with. If they didn't feel that they were getting a good deal in one place, they'd you know go to another place. If they got mad at you, <laughs> they you know instead of running, well they're not going to run here anymore. Then they'd go to Stafford Springs. Well, the core issue was basically the, the drivers all got together and they wanted to, they didn't like to pay off and whatever, so that they developed their own union, so to speak. Eventually that was broken up. Harvey ran basically the same, ran United the same way that France ran NASCAR. If you race for him, you race for him and nobody else. And if you did race for somebody else and he found out about it, he fined you or suspended you. There was so much politics going on in the early 50s. I mean, Rex Rick has established, uh, he was part of United and he broke off and ran the American Auto Racing Club. They tried replacing the Modifieds, but because the Modifieds had such a you know, bigger purse, it just didn't work. People wanted to see the modifieds. The speed bull did not open until around June. It was the only season where they ever ran a half a season. And they didn't have a very good feel of cars because everybody went to different places because the track didn't open on time. You've got to be firm, but then you've got to kind of you know, be very, very careful on some of the decisions that you, you have to make. You can't really run a track and not make some hard feelings, you know, and that makes it very, very hard to operate. They brought him in and he was able to handle the situation much easier than the people in the past. He was a, just the right type of person for the job. He, he was very, very cool and calm, uh, didn't get rattled under any circumstances, was a real gentleman, and, and everybody really liked him. He was a real nice guy. I mean, he, was, he never got excited. He never got, got mad at anybody. John was a super guy. Yeah. I always liked him. He was a good, good guy, I thought. Mild-mannered guy, but he, he kind of knew how to keep everything at bay. In other words, if things got a little excited or uh, he kind of knew how to soothe, you know, right. keep things going okay. I worked for him for 13 years and he was respected by all the drivers. He was a fair man. John was in the infield and then at, in, uh, at intermission he'd go up into the payoff stand which we have, it's just still there, and uh, anybody come in with any complaints or anything like that and he'd get the line up for the for the feature and uh, and, there, and then he'd you know there'd always be somebody want to talk to him about something that happened in the heat or something like that he was the guy that picked up all that for, for management for us he really kind of ran the place for him 
He really did. I mean, they stayed in the office and run the business end of it, and John ran the whole racing end of it. White House paid the insurance for the drivers. They had insurance with a independent insurance company from uh, Providence that took care of all the track insurance. And then uh, our insurance company took care of the rest of, you know, the stands and, and, and everything else. And he paid the purse, and he kept all the back gate money. The, the owners would keep all the, the admissions going in and all the beer money and, and stuff like that. He got the back gate. I mean, he, that was his. I mean, the money that came through there and everything else, he was accountable just to himself and to IRS. If any of the drivers ever needed any money, he would give them money to keep them going. If you got wrecked with White House and you go see him, he'd slip you 100 or 200 bucks to get the car back together with. And that was a lot of money back then. He'd come to my garage a couple of times. He'd put on, how you making out? You're going to make it next week? Well, we're working on it. And he'd reach in his pocket and give you a $100 bill or a $200 bill to make you come back. If you had a hard luck night, and you needed money to tow the car home, you could go to John and he'd, he'd throw you enough money to get the car home. Yeah, he was quite the guy. And uh, if we had a bad night, he'd always throw us a little extra in, you know, a little tow money, he'd call it. He took care of all the drivers. He used to live in that house down in the front during the uh, racing season. And they let him live. He used to live in that old house right at in front of this people. I used to go out and see him all the time. John was a nice guy. Him and I always got along good. Yeah, I used to go there. I used to have to walk from here because nobody would give me a ride here. We, there's a brook in back of the speedboat here. You know, you couldn't, you had to be 18 or 21, I don't know, to get in the pits. The two ways to sneak in were, were where the wall still is. You kind of walked along there, and especially in the summer, along about July, June, July, was overgrown. Those those things grew up. We cut a hole in the fence here. We used to sneak in the back by the men's room. So you try to sneak in there, go all the way down, and then come up the brook, right? Or go the other way and come down the brook. The brook was the key. You know, we, we figured no one was watching the brook. And a couple of friends of mine and I, we used we built a bridge. Matter of fact, we went and looked for it. It's gone. It's all rotted out. Going oh, out. Really? We used to we built a little bridge across it. A lot of guys did it <laughs> successfully. You probably batted like 500 getting in and out, you know. They would hold you for a while, you know. The thing is that we never, we always paid to get into the racetrack. You know, I mean, it wasn't like we were sneaking in totally. We just wanted to get in the pits. You didn't want to watch the race from the pits. You wanted to watch the race from the grandstand. You just wanted to be out there and you know, they'd hold you and then somebody would would come over and say, will you uh, just leave the kid alone? And after they were, they scared us a little bit or whatever. I think they even knew we, the hole was there, but they never used to say nothing about it. We used to sneak in there all the time so we could watch the races. In the intermission, we'd have a certain things, a clown show or something, you know, some sort of a thing. And we used to have a lot of uh, different types of shows, like thrill shows, you know, any kind of a, an act. We used to go to Chicago every winter and sign up all these acts at the Showman's Convention in Chicago. And you could buy anything up there, you know, country western or whatever. Lone Ranger was the original Lone Ranger, Clayton Moore, and they, they drew a fantastic crowd. I remember him going around the whole front straightaway with his horse, riding his horse, and people went crazy over that. We had, yeah, one or two uh, wrestling matches, but that didn't pan out. The boxing shows, they'd bring in the sailors from the sub base and they'd put on boxing matches. And they had Kuda Box, which was the guy they'd uh, blindfold him and he'd be able to drive around the track and, uh, you know, it was amazing the way he could do it and not crash. Back then, everything was different, you know? Because you didn't have TV the way you had it now. I remember the night Frankie Schneider came. Schneider was the, uh, was the national champion, the NASCAR champion. 
He came and did absolutely nothing. But they, they tried really hard to, to make it into uh, entertainment. My first recollection is going was probably six or seven years old. And because the guy across the street from me, Bert Taylor, had a race car. And Billy Harmon used to hang out there all the time, too. And I used to work on the car every night after school. I'd get home from grammar school and go over there, and that was my thing, and to help him with get tools and whatever they needed. So uh, At that young of age? Huh? Yeah, I was just into it. The first time uh, I went to the Speed Bowl was around 1957 or 58. Uh, I was five years old. And um, my uncle, Ray Turner, used to run the coffee shack, which is now where the sign-in booth is. It was a big, uh, well, it's probably not much bigger than it was now, but that's where they used to make the big tanks of coffee to run out to the concession stands. So he used to work there, and he would take us out to the races uh, now and then. So my first recollection was great noise, great smell, uh, lots of crashes, and dirt flying everywhere. My first hero of any kind was Benny DeRosia. When Benny was driving the 230 in the 50s, he was already pretty old. I think Benny had driv driven before that a lot. The 230 came from Highway Motor Sales in, in Hannum. And like I told you, it was a non-Ford, it was a Hudson. Barney's number was 230, but his NASCAR number was 23, and that's where that came from. All right, the 305 out front now, the 50-50 down under, trying to win it. Who's going to get it? It's Ted Dean and the 305 across the winner. Our great competition in the non-Fords was Skippy Spencer's 45 that Teddy Stack drove. Oh, Ted Stack was excellent. He was another very, very good driver. Real gentleman. Real, real nice man. Ted Stack, nice guy. Good driver. I, I used to really like Ted Stack. He was a good, good race car driver. I know he was uh, Dickie Beauregard's rival. Them two would get into it often, but Ted was a good driver. He was kind of like the Cale Yarborough of Waterford. <laughs> he wasn't a rough driver, I mean. I would say he's one, he was one of the top drivers on the speed goal for years. I mean, he was a great driver. And then the nine, Billy Simon's nine, that Charlie Webster drove. Charlie Webster was a real gentleman. I mean, he, him and my brother grew up together years ago, and they, they went to school together and everything. So I really knew Charlie. You know, because he was a, helmet carrier, you know, he didn't have his own stuff. He'd just show up and drive. Quiet, knew what he was doing, concentrated on the task at hand, uh, just to play nice guy. He was an excellent driver, big guy, you know, you'd never kind of think that he, he would be driving a car. He was a big guy, red-headed guy, nice Nice disposition. Charlie Webster was a wonderful man. He was a great driver. I liked watching him. I really didn't know him, but I, I liked watching him. And uh, between he, Ted Stack, and and uh, Dicky, I mean, they they put on a whale of a show all the time. Now, who were some of the guys you battled with on the track at the speedball back then? Well, there was a bunch of uh, Mo Gersey. Uh, Don Collins, Redfoot, Bill Slater, Dick Beauregard. Oh, Dick Bureau, crazy. I can tell you stuff about Dick Beauregard. We had a midget show the same night, okay? And he was talking to one of the midget drivers and he said, hey, why don't you let me try the thing? And the guy said, sure, you want to warm up a midget? He said, yeah, I'd love to try it. 
So midgets are completely different from stock cars. Dick, he gets in the thing, he drives it just like it, he had been in it for 25 years. He went down the chute, went into the wall, went upside down, and skidded upside down. I said, he's dead, he's dead, he can't get, come out of that. We were pulling the car, bringing the car over, and he, he was shaking his head like that. I said, my God, look at him, he's still alive. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. I don't remember him being pugnacious or, or, you know, combative out of a race car, you know, but he was Dirty Dick. Dick was rough. Dick was rough. If he had to rough you up to get by you, he would do it. Yeah, he was a little tough. He was a hard-nosed driver, balls to the wall, had no fear. He knew how to get under you and boot you out of the way, you know. <laughs> you didn't know what to expect out of him. He didn't even know what he was going to do until he got to it. If you were in his way, he'd come up and he'd tap you once. I'm here. He'd come up and tap you twice. Pick a lane and stay there because if I tap you the third time, I'm gonna pick your lane for you. <laughs> so. Dick, <laughs> he was a pusher and a banger and whatnot. We, we went to John Whitehouse a few times because of Dick, yeah. Dick Beer guy was in his day was like Teddy Christopher, I guess. He'd get under you and move you out of the way without you even knowing it happening. I remember one night he got into a tussle that kind of <laughs> kind of boiled over into the pits and everything. He was just a hard racer. When my son started driving, he came one time and he says, you know, if there's a half room for half a car, you go. <laughs> you know? <laughs> it's not like that anymore, Dick. The stuff falls off the cars now. <laughs> We were good friends, so I rooted for Dickie, and, uh, but I really liked Don Collins, too. That's uh, too contrasting. Uh, oh, very much so. <laughs> but he did tell me, of all the people he's ever raced, and he raced against a lot of people, he said the toughest man he ever raced against was Don Collins. Really? Yeah. He says he was the toughest. I mean, that's Lucchese and no matter who. He said Don was the toughest. I always have this theory about some of the really great racers. You had guys that, w that were exciting to watch. Beauregard was exciting to watch. You know he was going to do something. Something was going to happen. Don Collins wasn't an exciting racer. He was just an extremely proficient one. Don Collins, Willimannic, 106. He was fast, clean. He was a clean driver. He hardly ever wrecked a car. Well, Collins was, you know, the guy that was the Waterford guy, you know, I mean, he was the guy that was going to win. Was the guy to beat, clearly was. Don Collin was cool, very, very smart. He had his own business, a garage business, and he was an excellent driver. Don Collins was kind of a showman. He, was, he always come there well-dressed and black. He always had Western shirts on. He was always really thin. I remember how thin he was and how quiet he was. Didn't make a lot of noise or anything. He wasn't a real person to associate with the bands or nothing either. He just, he just, he'd win the race, go off about his way, he didn't get involved in too much. Never swore, never said a bad word about anybody. Very, very, very quiet man. You didn't know what he was thinking. All you knew was he could drive a race car. You never knew what he was thinking. His mind was always working on the race. Don was a big person on tires. He would take care of all the tires because in his theory, that was the first thing that tr touched the track. And if they weren't right, the rest of the car's not right. He set up his own cars. He knew how to set them up. 
never drove him out of control, and he was very crafty, very smart driver. The smoothest driver that I've ever seen in my life. Don Collins, he was a, he was a clean driver. Uh, I used to watch him, but of course my favorite was Bill Slater. He was a, um, a very, well, you couldn't miss him. I mean, he, he was, he, he could get mad very easily. You could get upset very easily. He was, he was a very rugged guy, and, and he didn't take any, he didn't take any slack from anybody. I mean, he, that was him. Wild Bill Slater, and he was wild. He would bump and push and grind, and he was the one I put in the starters box, and uh, I was winning a lot of main events, and uh, I was asked to maybe come in second. So I was taking it easy through the crowd, called the hip show, is what they call that, where you choose where you want to be and not come in, come in second or third. And off the top of the track came Wild Bill Slater into the side of my car. Right in front of the grandstand, the number 76 with Bill Slater up and over as he throws the wheel right in front of the grandstand, but it looks like he's all right. He's trying to shake himself loose with that safety belt now. He'll be all right. Yes, sir. How about that action right in front of the grandstand? Bill Slater throws the wheel. And there he is. He's out of there, and he's all right. And if that certainly isn't a thrilling climax to the race being held here at the Waterford and London Speed Bowl today, I'll certainly have to see another one to see one like that. What a thrill, what a spill by Bill Slater in the number 76. And uh, the whole stand stood up and booed me. And I stopped in the middle of the track, right in front of the starters box, and got out of my car and walked through the stands, and they were hissing and booing me. I walked up to the starters box, and I, I mean, the announcer's box, I said, can I use the mic for a second? I said, look, if you think Bill Slater should have won the race, give him the, give him the, the, the money. But just give me a quarter to get back over the bridge. And they went, yay! It's best one of the year. <laughs> Slater and I later became such close friends that he is the godfather of my daughter. But back then, I had no use for him. They were just so successful. In 1959, they were just so successful. Bill Slater was real successful when he teamed up with the Connecticut Valley Rocket. At the end of the 50s, Vitari and Bombasi, the two people in, in Essex, uh, went racing. The story was that Gene White was driving the car for them, not doing very well. And Slater was driving the 11 for Baldy Simons. Simons car, the 11, was overheating all the time. So one Wednesday night, they're getting tired of Gene White, and Vitari watches Slater get out of the 11, steaming the 11, steaming up and everything, through his helmet in the car or somewhere. So he goes over to and asks Slater if he wants to drive the V8. And Slater says, I not, I'm not sure I can handle a Chevrolet. Anyway, he got into the V8 on the next Wednesday night finished second. Then that next Saturday won the race and that was the start of the, the V8 which from 1959 to 1965 it's difficult to find a more successful modified team. And I can remember Bill Slater's car. The hood, they lowered the hood down so the hood went down at a 45 degree angle and I thought that was the neatest looking car. They had a real good rate car. They were kind of ahead of everybody at the, at the time because they were one of the first ones to come out with the V8 Chevys. And then they left. And then after 59, they left when NASCAR got into Norwood. They were really something else. They had such a phenomenal success. Owners were kind of ticked off at him for leaving, but you know he ended up bettering himself. They went to Norwood, and Collins drove the V8 and won the championship, uh, which tells you something about how good Collins was and how good that car was. That team was born at Waterford. That great success wins at Trenton and wins at Langhorne and wins at Old Bridge. I mean big 100 lappers, 200 lappers. That team was born on a Wednesday night at Waterford. 
See, beginning, I told you we used to have Wednesday and Saturday night racing, okay? And then later on, we decided to go ahead with uh, a Friday night show. That didn't draw people either. I didn't go for it because it was too close to our regular race night, Friday and Saturday, double header, it's tough, you know, it's tough enough to get people there for one night. After a while, that Wednesday night racing w didn't pay. And Wednesday night shows just didn't work anymore. That's the reason why they eliminate them, because they didn't draw people. That division, um, you start building, uh, you know, with something uh, that doesn't cost as much then pretty soon you're almost up to the same as the modified are. They were a good division. My uncle, my father's brother, he wanted out. The only remaining one was uh, Tony Albino. He was the original. And my father, Frank. I was on a first-name basis, as was most of the other drivers. They were down-to-earth people. They weren't, well, we own the track, and you're lucky we let you drive here. And it wasn't one of those kind of things at all. You know, they were just, just regular nice people. Them guys that ran that racetrack, they, I, I think they really did a good job for way back then, because it was all new to them, too. None of them was affiliated with racing, I didn't think. And they did a good job. Gentlemen, we bring to a conclusion this afternoon's racing program here at the New London Waterford Speedball. We sincerely hope that you've enjoyed the filming of the races held here today. And until next race day, why this is your reporter Bob Edgren saying so long now. I'm taking too long, and you people tell me, okay, just tell me, shut up, you know? That's what my wife and my daughter say. They say, I can't believe, it. I'm 81. Yeah, that's impressive. And they said, I cannot believe how you can remember <laughs> this stuff. Now into that second turn and down the back stretch. In his qualifying run is Frank Dordeaux from New York City. Into that third turn now, around into the fourth turn, and around to that checkered flag. Is there a picture of that in your book? I think so, I'm not sure. Yep. <laughs> That's awesome, Dave. You're all done, buddy. Okay. I'm not much of a talker. Well, I, don't stop me while I'm thinking here. No, no, no. <laughs> Thomas. Yeah, it was famous. You can look at my pictures now. Yeah, we can drink some beer. <laughs> <laughs>